Okay, so we are going to get started tonight, and I apologize profusely for uh, not having the study guides. <laughs> I wasn't able to get them printed, but um, we're going to continue tonight's study, or this month's study, about the way God views his people. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I've been really, really enjoying this series. Um, it's been absolutely amazing, really blessed me. God's been really speaking to me about identity, and that's what this whole uh, study is about, your identity. And um, the summary of this whole thing, uh, thank you, brother. You, you. <laughs> the study of this whole uh, series is basically, it, it, it is a natural desire for people to search for their identity, which many times is derived from their personal experiences encountered in this life. Most people find themselves assuming the identities which were attached to them by their parents, mentors, or heroes. But once a person comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it is the Lord who clearly declares who they are. Amen? And so our passage that we're going to be uh, deriving this study from is 1 Peter 2.9. And in that, Apostle Peter says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Let us all pray. God, we thank you tonight that we are able to be here in your presence. We thank you for your understanding, Lord God, that you're going to give forth to us. We thank you that we're able to not only... <clears throat> Come to saving grace, Lord God, and come to salvation. But thank you for the ability to be able to change our identity, Lord God. We identify with a lot of things, but I thank you that through the power of the Holy Ghost, through your spirit, that we are able to find who we truly are and who you truly created us to be. And I pray that in this study, that you will change minds, Lord God, that you will change hearts, that we will be conformed to your image. In the name of Jesus, amen. So, um, this month we've been talking about you know, being a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Pastor Matt talked about that and, you know, gave us some understanding of what it means to be a chosen generation. Um, we talked about being a royal, a royal priesthood. My brother Mejia spoke on that. And a holy nation, Sister Linda spoke on that as well. But tonight I'm going to be talking about a peculiar people. And this is the last lesson of the series. But I'm really going to go in depth and I, I believe this last part really encapsulates everything that this whole passage is talking about. Amen? So I'm going to start off with a question. What makes us a peculiar people? Okay, I looked up the definition, and according to Merriam-Webster, the, uh, the, the definition of a peculiar is a characteristic of only one person, a group, or thing. In other words, it's distinct. So that's what peculiar means. It means that you're distinct, you're set apart, right? So what makes us a peculiar people as God's people? Well, number one, if you're taking notes, identity. Identity. Identity is, you know, who you associate yourself with. It, identity causes you to um, choose how you dress, how you speak, and things like that. Um, the second thing that makes us a peculiar people is our speech. And if you notice, your identity affects your speech. And lastly, number three, something that um, characterizes us as peculiar people is your conduct or your lifestyle. And so I'm going to talk about these three things. These are going to be the main three things that we're going to be talking about tonight and really going in depth and understanding why we are the way we are, okay? There are certain things that we do, certain things that we don't do, and a lot of times people, you know, preach those things or say, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, or you can do this and you can't do this, but nobody tells us why. And a lot of times we think that we do things to make us holy, all right? If, if that was the first part of it, a holy nation, or we do things to make us set apart, you know, because we're set apart, I'm not going to hang out with these people, all right? But that's not what God's talking about in, in 1 Peter 2.9. We do certain things because we are already. And what I mean by that is you don't do things to make you holy. 
God already made you holy through the blood of Jesus. And so because I am holy, I'm not going to do certain things, okay? Because, for example, this computer is made with certain uh, uh, materials. I can't do certain things with it. It's not that, you know, I can't put it in the water. It doesn't belong in there. Why? Because of what it is. And if it goes in the water, it will be broken, right? And so there's certain things that we don't do. There's certain things that we do because of who we are. And that's what we're going to hit on today. So what are things that make us a, pe a, a, sorry, a peculiar people? One thing is we're obedient. Unlike the world um, and that's described in Romans chapter 1, verses 25 through 32, it says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, um, so meaning lesbianism, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. So homosexuality. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, and this word fornication means anything, okay, so this is not just, you know, hitting on homosexuality, a lot of people like to hit on that, but this is, you know, if you're heterosexual, you're sleeping around with different people, or maybe you just sleep with one person, but you're not married, okay, fornication, um, pornography, these are, all these different things are within that word fornication, okay, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, so just being angry all the time, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, uh, malignity, whispers, okay, so constantly causing strife and gossip, backbiters, all right, you're one way to somebody and then the other way when they're not looking at you, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, Nobody keeps a promise anymore, okay? And that's, we, we, we deal with that a lot in just society. You know, a lot of times we can't trust God because we're so used to a promise being broken to us, amen? Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, so they knew that God doesn't like all this stuff, all right? And this is also in the context of where we are now that they which commit such things are worthy of death. So they knew that the judgment of God for doing all these things is death. If you ask anybody in Stockton pretty much, you know, uh, you know, do you know God? For, you know, for the most part, a lot of people in Stockton know about God. They know about Jesus. I had one friend one time, he, he said in class, he's like, you know what? I'm going to hell on a super slide. And it's like, and then that was in high school. And so, that's what this scripture is talking about. They know the consequence for what they do, but they just simply don't care. Okay? Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, this whole letter was talking to the church. And Paul, when he wrote Romans chapter 1 and the whole uh, letter of Romans, it was writing to a church. And so these were things that were found in the church, okay? And all this comes from disobedience. God says, this is how I made you, okay? This is what I want you to do because you are my son or daughter. This is how you operate as one of my children. But in being disobedient, all these forms of wickedness come into play. Another passage, uh, another letter by Paul in 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verses 1 through 2 says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. Now the first point I'm hitting on is, 
as a peculiar people, we're obedient. When God tells us to do something, what makes us peculiar is that we obey. We listen to a higher authority. The world, they don't do that. To them, I get to do whatever I want. What's something that we always hear? I'm a grown man, you know? Ain't ain't nobody gonna tell me what to do. But you know, there's a whole lot of people behind bars sleeping on a cot because of that mentality. You have to understand that somebody's always gonna tell you what to do. You just have to choose who you want to tell you. But there's always gonna be somebody telling you what to do. Now, whether you recognize that somebody's telling you to do something or not, you're gonna be obeying somebody. But the, exactly. But the difference between us and the world, and if you are a son or daughter of God, is that you're obedient to what God says. You're, you look at what God says, and you know what? That's, that's the final word. What's in this, in this Bible? I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to follow it. And we are obedient because we have been adopted into a new family, a new people, and a new culture. We don't obey what the culture says anymore. You know, and God has blessed this church to be a very diverse church. And so whatever culture you come from, that's no longer your culture anymore. You adopt a new culture when you are adopted into the body of Christ. It's no longer what your family does and what your heritage does. I'm not obedient to that anymore. When you say, oh yeah, you know, come over and do this, um, if that's not lining up with God and what he's saying, I'm not going to obey that because I have a new family. There's a new people that I associate with. Remember the number one thing that I, I hit on was identity. Okay? We don't lo- no longer identify who we came from. But now we identify with a new, a new crowd. First uh, Peter, and you know, we were just talking about all the disobedience, but now First Peter uh, chapter 1 verses 14 through 16, says, as obedient children, and this is Peter talking to um, grown people. He's not talking to children, although children are in there, but he's talking about the whole church. He's saying, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, meaning the things that we came from, okay, the different sins that we all came from. We all have a past. We all have things. Whether you were born in the church or not, that, that doesn't matter. Even people born in the church was doing some stuff. And so once you finally decide, you know what, I'm going to stop doing that. As obedient children, you're not going to go after those things anymore. That used to be you. But once you've been baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus, you've received the gifts of the Holy Ghost, those are now, that now becomes an old self. And so now you have a a choice. Am I going to obey my flesh and my old self or am I going to obey my heavenly father? But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Once again, we don't do things to become holy. We are holy because God is holy. And once you are baptized in Jesus' name, once you are filled with the Holy Ghost and you repented, that holiness is transferred to you. So now, I don't go to certain places because I am holy, okay? The Bible says that Paul was talking to the church, and he said, Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? And so the same way that, you know, even if I've noticed this, that people who don't even go to church, they come to a church, they won't do certain things. I mean, it's, they're a little bit more uh, bold now, but, you know, you go to a certain place and everything, and you won't, you won't do certain things at the church. You won't say certain things. You, know, you won't cuss around the pastor, or you won't say certain jokes. Why? Because we consider this place to be holy. But Paul said, know you not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? And so, knowing that, our bodies have become holy. So I won't do certain things. I won't look at certain things because I'm already holy. And I don't want to desecrate the temple of God. So the same way you want graffiti on the walls of this beautiful building that God has blessed us with, that's what God is saying. I own you now. You are not your own anymore. 
Scripture says you've been bought with the price, the precious blood of Jesus. And so because of that, amen, I don't do certain things. I don't go back to my former lust, but instead I act as an obedient child to our Father, who is Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses uh, 13 to 16 says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Remember, this is what makes us a peculiar people. We're obedient. Okay? So it says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. A lot of people say, God can only judge me. Okay? You can't tell me anything. Only God can tell me what to do and all this other kind of stuff. But God uses man. Okay? And when I say man, I'm not just saying the male, but mankind. To every ordinance of man, for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. So what this passage is talking about, for us in our context, it will be your president, it will be our governor, okay? Now, whether you voted for these people or not, or whether you didn't vote at all, that's not the point. We are supposed to be obedient, be respectful to those in authority. Why? Because right here it says that God's put them there, okay? Doesn't matter. We, you know, went prayer and everything. Doesn't matter who you voted for. A lot of us maybe, you know, didn't have somebody that we wanted going to office across America, but we have to step back and say, you know what? I don't identify as, Amer as an American alone. Before that, I'm a child of God. And because of that, I submit to whatever my father and our king, Jesus Christ, sets in place. Because he has a will, he has a plan set in place. And so whether it goes against my grain or not, that's not the point. The point is, God put that person there. I remember somebody got elected, and I was praying. I was like, God, you know, you got to do something. And then I realized, like, wait a minute. We just had an election, and you put that person there, so obviously that's your will. So instead of praying, no, take this person out of office, I prayed, God, have your hand on this person. I pray that he or she gets saved. I pray that they become repented. I pray that you will, you know, baptize them in your name, fill them with the Holy Ghost. You know, that's God's will. Amen? And so when we're obedient in that way, God can use us in great, in great fashion. And it goes on to say, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So we're Americans I love being American. I'm proud to be an American. I thank God for being American. Not everybody's able to say that. And I think it's wonderful how, you know, like, for example, the Williams, they were able to come over here, immigrate, and become citizens. Long process, you know. Uh, God has blessed me that I'm in the process right now of bringing my future wife over here, Tiffany, you know, to make her a citizen. Well, not right away, but the thing is, is that although you can be proud of being free, Okay, we're not supposed to use that freedom to just act any kind of way. Why? Because right here it says that we're servants of God. You may be free in the physical, but you're still bound in another way. And we're bound to the word of God. We're bound to what he says, what he is ordering for us to do. Which he commands us to be obedient to those in authority over us. Why? So when people look at us, being obedient to people that we don't agree with, or maybe we do agree with them. Other people are able to look at you and say, how is it that you still have peace even though you don't agree with this person? How is it that you're not out here protesting and causing a ruck ruckus and tearing up our city? It's because I obey a higher authority. And my authority says to still pay respect, even though I may disagree. Or maybe I do agree, and if you do agree, that's okay too. Amen? Another thing that makes us a peculiar people is love. First Peter, and we're probably going to be staying in, in First Peter a lot, um, chapter 4, verses 8 through 9 says, And above all things, have fervent charity or love amongst yourselves. 
for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Okay? I love this passage because, you know, we always hear about the love of God. We always hear about how, you know, God loves us so much. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But in this passage, it's talking about man. It's talking about us. And one thing that distincts or distinguishes us from the world is that we love people. We love each other. Another passage says, they will know you are my disciples. Why? Because you have the power of the Holy Ghost? No. Because you cast out demons? No. Because you pray for the sick and they're healed? No. Because you're able to quote scripture all day long? No. Because you have love one toward another. This is how we operate as a peculiar people. This love is supposed to be among spouses. This love is supposed to be amongst children and their parents and parents to the children. This is supposed to be between brothers and sisters, brothers and brothers, sisters and sisters. And this is supposed to be between us and everyone in here. Whether you get along with them 100% or not, this is what distinguishes us. And when something's done wrong to you, it says right here, it didn't say God's love. It said, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. When somebody does something something wrong to me, what makes me peculiar and what makes me different and set apart from the world is that I don't act crazy like everybody else. I don't go to this whole, man, shoot, you know, if you, if you remember me from my, back in my day, man, what, what is that? You're a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Put that nonsense away. We are a new creature. And because we are a new creature, we talked about this before, you have the power of the Holy Ghost living inside of you to do things that's not usual and not normal for you. What Peter said in the, in the other scripture that we read, not submitting to your former lusts. If you used to pop off on people, that's a form of lust that he was talking about. The maliciousness, the, the, the murderer and all that. Okay, and just because you haven't killed somebody physically, Jesus said, if you have hate towards somebody, okay, then you've already committed murder. And I'm talking about like, you know, strong hate. Like, you, you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so we have to develop love okay love is the fruit of the spirit if you don't have love which the bible says that god is love i think that's in john or first john it says that god is love as his children we have to have that fruit of the spirit abiding within us and from that if you have god's perfect love working inside of you as a matter of fact, let's just go there. I believe it's Galatians 5.22. Okay. Galatians 5.22. And I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit before that. Um, so we get a, a, a good understanding of who we're not. Okay, remember, we're a peculiar people, and we're talking about what makes us a peculiar people. We identify with God and how he is. We don't identify as our culture, okay, whether you have a certain culture that you claim. We don't identify as a certain skin color. We don't identify as a certain family, okay? This is how we identify it. It says in verse 19, uh, chapter 5, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It does not matter. You know, we were getting excited about being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter if you're all that. 
If you continue in that, in that list, you will be amongst the people that Jesus said to his disciples. There will be many in that day that come up to me and say, Lord, Lord, have, didn't have any, cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And what is he going to tell you? Depart from me, for I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. We don't want that. But I'm not here just to preach doom and gloom, okay? Because right after that, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and notice it says fruit, it's singular, is love. Love. When you partake of an orange or a banana, there are certain nutrients within that um, fruit. Amen? So we eat food to get certain things that are within it. So within love, if we're walking in God, and we're allowing his love to flow through us, we're going to get joy. So that means you can go through hardship. You might still be crying. You may not be happy, but you have peace, right? Okay? You have joy, peace, long-suffering. You're able to handle all that nonsense that happens at, at work, okay, while everybody else is, you know, it, you know by the, uh, the, the water cooler and, and talking and say, man, see, I can't stand this person and da 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 and causing a whole bunch of strife within the office, making it hard to work there, you're long-suffering. You're like, you know what, that may be, I was a little irritated, but you know what, that might be just be having a bad day. You don't know what they're going through, you know? So where we're partaking of love, we have long-suffering, we have gentleness, goodness, faith, okay? Meekness, temperance, which is self-control, and it says, against such, there is no law. There's no law that forbids having all these things. What law is going to forbid love? What law says, no, we can't have joy. We can't have peace. We can't have long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, and temperance. It says, against such, there is no law. And they that are Christ." So if you are a son or a daughter of God, you have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Which means that I may be able to experience something, but I'm not going to go following that feeling and taking me down some pathway. Amen? So what makes us peculiar? We operate in love. Another thing that makes us peculiar is humility. First Peter Chapter 5, verses 5 through 6 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. And for those of us who are, are younger in here, and even, you know, maybe some older ones, there's is, there is somebody else that's older than you, it is our job to submit, to humble ourselves. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God, watch this, resisteth the proud. And giveth grace to the humble. And then this next part is amazing, I believe. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humility. Humility is not something that God will do to you. Humility is something you're supposed to do yourself. If you didn't catch it, I'll read it again. He says, for God resisteth the proud, meaning God didn't make you proud. Okay, and the devil didn't make you proud either. You made yourself proud. Okay, whether it's, you know, boasting too much in your ability. Okay. And it says right after that, and giveth grace to the humble. So how do I get God's grace? I humble myself. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that ye, that he may exalt you in due time. How do I humble myself? Okay, maybe, you know, some of us in here are struggling with pride. You know, maybe we compare ourselves amongst ourselves. We compare ourselves to our brother and sister and say, well, you know what, at least I'm not doing that. Or maybe we don't even do that in church. Maybe it's not a positive pride. Maybe it's a negative pride. God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and what do you do? Every time you wake up, get in the shower, you come out, go to the mirror, say, man, I can't stand my I look horrible. But God just said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You see, negative pride works just the same. Telling God that you're not something when he says that you are. When 
you are a son or a daughter of God, you have certain things that you're able to partake of, and then you tell God, no, that's not true, you're calling me a liar. That's pride too. Saying that what God says about you isn't true. When he says he loves you, no, you don't love me. And then soon, you, you feel that resistance, you feel that separation. It's not because God's trying to draw away from you. It's because you're pushing away. It says right here, God resists the proud. So how do I humble myself? I have to get in the prayer room. How do I humble myself? I have to fast. How do I humble myself? I have to read the word. Find out how he speaks. How does he talk? What does God sound like? So when I get certain thoughts, I'm able to distinguish, oh, wow, that's God. It's not hard to understand God. It really isn't. And for me, you know, for years, I thought it was. I was like, God, you know, you're not talking to me. You must not want me. And so I thought that, you know, when I turned 18, I'm just going to leave the church. You know, and I was like, maybe I'll just be like one of those people that go away and then come back, you know, on a watch night service, you know, crying, like, God saved me. And he brought me back. And, you know, thank God. And everybody's all cheering and happy to have me back. But then I realized that I didn't have to do all that. I realized what I needed to do was be obedient. What we were talking about earlier, that's what makes us peculiar, okay? We're obedient when everybody else just wants to do what they want to do, and despite what God tells them what to do. Because, see, everybody knows the voice of God, okay? Even atheists know the voice of God. It's just that they choose not to, okay? The, the difference between us and demons, it's funny because we... we choose to, you know, not believe God. But the Bible says that the demons know that there's one God, and they tremble. But see, they just choose not to obey. But they know he's the true living God. And they know that what he says is law. But they just choose not to obey. But as children of God, we have to be obedient. Amen? And so because I wasn't obedient, I wasn't acting like the child of God I was supposed to be. I added a whole bunch of stuff. I got involved in what Paul and Peter were talking about, okay? The fornication. In my uh, instance, it was the pornography, okay? And everything that went with that. All because of disobedience. And then you know what happened to me? I felt like God wasn't there. God, where you at? I was too proud I would sit right here all the time in the front row with my mom. Never sang a song, never clapped, never stood. When they say stand up, when they say lift your hands, didn't do none of that. Pride. Oh, you, you thought you were better? No. I was fearful. I was so prideful, I thought that everybody was looking at me. I'm, I'm scared to do anything because my mom told me so many times, she's like, hey, don't nobody care about you. <laughs> No, nobody came here to look at you. Didn't want to sing in the choir because everybody's looking at me. That's pride. God resists the proud. And it didn't matter how many times I came here and cried and bawled my eyes out. My heart was still prideful. But until one day, I said, you know what, God? I'm going to just be obedient. And I'm going to allow you to do whatever you want. This is like, what, six years that this was going on? Probably a little longer. And finally, I'm like, you know what? You have to take this girl out of my life because I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be obedient. But, because you know how hard it is. But you do it, and I won't, I won't go back. So, texting a few days later, girl's like, you know what? I don't think we should be together. I'm like, why? And she's like, oh, it just feels weird, you know? Like, I mean, we're friends, you know? And I was like, did you start feeling this like a few days ago? She's like, yeah. Okay. All of a sudden, my ears are open after years. I mean, the only time, I got the Holy Ghost first grade, okay. And I was like, what, six or seven years old? And hadn't hear, heard God for years. And for the first time, I was talking to somebody, and they were asking me something. And I was quoting scripture, and I was like, I don't think that's in the Bible, <laughs> but... I was like, let me look this up. I looked it up, and it was in the Bible, and I was like, whoa, when did I memorize that? All because of obedience. All because of humbling myself. 
But then it came time that temptation came along, and I didn't want to be obedient. Instead, I just want to be a nice guy. I didn't want to be looked at as a jerk, right? Fell back into it immediately. Couldn't hear God anymore. Until I humbled myself again and said, you know what? I'm just going to obey. I'm your son, and I'm going to act as a son. I'm not going to be one of those kids that does not receive the chastisement of my father. Because when you do that, you nullify your sonship. You nullify your daughtership, if that's a word. Okay? We don't want to do that. Amen? I saw a billboard when we were coming back from a um, youth convention, and it was for a movie I haven't seen the movie. I'm not going to watch the movie. But it was La Llorona. And it said in a caption, she wants your children. The Bible says that the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. And if we don't understand these things as a peculiar people, if we don't understand our identity, that in our identity we are obedient, because of who we are, okay? We love one another. We love our wives. We love our husbands, our daughters, our sons, everybody, because of who we are. We are humble because of our identity in Christ. If we don't do these things, then your children will be taken. The devil wants our kids so bad. And you know, because we're so caught up in where we came from, and we still identify with that, we pass that on to the next generation. And we wonder why. Why is this person, why is my son, why is my daughter growing up like this? I bring them to church. I, I, you know, we do this. We, we go to all the events and everything. But what's happening is that you don't truly identify with God. We don't truly identify with our Father, and because of that, that is passed down. And so we have to change who we identify with. Because of us being a peculiar people, we have to change how we talk. We don't say certain things anymore. We don't talk a certain way. And even if it's not cussing, there's just certain ideologies that we have to let go of. And so you don't feel like I'm picking on you. I grew up from sixth grade all the way to my senior year in high school. Um, I went to Ben Holt College Prep School. And very humanistic, you know. I still love my alma, alma mater. I still love that school and everything. I'm grateful for the education I received there. But the problem was is that it was very humanistic. It was very fleshly. And so when I went to Bible college right afterwards, and I heard my teachers say that you're earning the highest education in the land, I couldn't understand that. I was like, how is reading the Bible the highest education in the land? For two years, I could not understand that. I, I thought that was the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> I was like, science and math, that is the highest education in the land. But then God spoke to me and said, you're learning about me. And I'm the one who gave all your teachers and your professors the ability to do what they do. So when you learn of me, you're learning from the, about the source from all this stuff, from what all this stuff comes from, that is the highest education land. So for me, I had to change that. I had to change the way I, I viewed women. I had to change the way I would want my wife to be, okay? I mean, just going through school and everything, you get caught up in certain conversations, all right? You and your friends are looking at stuff and everything. You guys want your wives to do certain things and all this kind of stuff, all right? I had to change the way I spoke, even about a wife. Just because, you know, people use the scripture that, you know, the marriage bed is undefiled. Okay, but right after that, it talks about that it can be defiled with fornications and things like that. Okay? The marriage bed is only undefiled if you keep it that way. That's what that passage is talking about. So we have to be careful how we speak about things. Why? We're peculiar people. It should be that when you're at work, 
and I hear this a lot, and all the other women are complaining about their husbands, but they don't understand why you don't. They should look at that and be like, you're kind of peculiar. Oh, yeah. First Peter 2, 9, I'm a, I'm a part of a peculiar people. You know, I, I, don't, I don't do that because I identify with a different group. I have a different father. I have a different family. I have a different culture. And we don't speak about our husbands like that. And then the husbands, not looking at, man, I had somebody tell me, try to bring me into some stuff. I was like, yeah, look at this video. And I was like, what? Ain't you married? Are you showing me this? Like, what are you doing? And as, as husbands, we don't operate. Not going, well, you know, I ain't touching. You know, it's okay to, you know, window shop, you know. What? That's not what our father said. Jesus said if you look at a woman and you lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And if that's not good enough for you, science even backs that up and says that when you're watching something, it activates the part of the brain that it thinks that you're actually doing it. Okay? And so we have to watch how we speak. We have to watch who we identify with. Why? Because we are a peculiar people. And this speech affects our conduct. It affects our lifestyle. Okay? When we're at work, it should be that people are saying, man, there's something. And even if they don't tell you all the time, it should be when opportunity arises for them to point you out that you're different, that they should be able to do that. Is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? There should be. Um, a passage in, found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, it talks about Abraham. And it says, now the Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. Meaning, you, I'm, coming, I'm bringing you to a new identity. You're not going to identify with your country anymore. It's okay to be proud to be American or Mexican or wherever you, know, you guys come from, okay? Italian and all these different things that we're just proud of, you know? African. But God's calling us out of that. There's a new family, okay? He says, get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This was not just to the Jews. This was before Abraham was circumcised. Okay. And so, which means that even the Gentiles, us, which is most of us, okay, we're able to partake of what God was telling Abram right here before he became Abraham, okay? And so, God is telling us, you have to come out of that, okay? I, I know, you know, you're used to that. I know you're used to identifying with that, but you have to come out because in this new family, in this new culture, we operate differently, we don't operate based off skin color. We don't operate based off skin tone. We don't operate based off a language. Did you notice that we have different languages because of the Tower of Babel? But then when you go to Acts chapter 2, God gives a new language to unite us once again. They were listening to all these apostles and, and different people speaking in tongues, the 120. They're like, they're speaking our language. God gave us the Holy Ghost, and used language to unify us once again. Amen? And so even if we don't speak the same language on earth, God has given us a language from a new family, from a new kindred, a new culture, all right? A new ethnicity and nationality, which is the people of God. And we're able to communicate in the heavenlies. Communi communicate with our Father. You may not be able to understand, you know, what the other person is saying, but there are some times we have tongues interpretations, and there have also been times when somebody's preaching in one language, and the person in the audience goes up to them after the, afterward, and like, I didn't know you spoke fluent such and such, and they're like, no, I don't. Like, well, when you were speaking, you were speaking my language the whole time. 
That's God. God is here to unify us, not separate us. And if anybody uses God and uses this, his word, to do that, they're not of God. Okay? So, like, I'm, like I was saying, it's kingdom over culture. Amen? There was one time that I was, uh, I was in prayer, and um, I was praying because uh, I was going to be preaching the next day or teaching the next day. And I was, I was in the sanctuary, and I was praying. And to this day, I have no idea who the lady was. But she's praying down, down, uh, downstairs. I'm in the balcony. I'm praying. And then I, I started praying, you know, praying in tongues. And I started really you know, kind of getting intense. And then I noticed her tongue changed. She was speaking in tongues, but she was speaking a, a different language, you know, a different dialect. And I, but you can notice certain, you know, words and certain phrases in, in what people are saying. I mean, that's how people always, like, you know, make fun of people, right? Okay? So as we're praying, I notice her dialect changes. And immediately I just felt in my spirit. I was like, I have no idea what we're praying about. But whatever we're praying about, God brought us in unity. And then right when I was about to leave, her dialect changed back to whatever tongue she has. God is trying to unite us. And he's trying to show us that we, because we are a peculiar people, we operate different. We talk differently. We identify differently. Okay? Scripture says that there is no Jew. There is no Greek. There's no male or female when it comes to the body of Christ. All that stuff goes away. All right? So if... If you're looking for, you know, the world's always looking for, okay, rights. We need rights. We need rights. But in the kingdom of God, it's always been. It's never been. I know it seems that, you know, religion, you know, used to be that women were down here and the men were up here and, like, certain ethnicities were up here and certain ethnicities were down here, but it's never been like that. The problem is that man got in the way and interpreted it that way, but that wasn't from the beginning. Even the Jews being you know, the chosen people of God, that wasn't about being a, a certain ethnicity. God just chose those people. He said, I didn't choose you because you were great. I chose you to be a city on a hill. I chose you to be a light. They were supposed to incorporate people into their families. You know, their servants. They were supposed to become part of them. It wasn't that the Jews were the only ones that could be saved and go to heaven and everybody else was just damned to hell. No. The Bible says that, it, uh, uh, man, he would that none would perish, but that all come to repentance. God has not changed. And the Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It has always been his will for all of mankind to make it back to him. And so now in the New Testament, he's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to use a diverse group of people. People that what he told Abraham, I'm going to make you father of many nations. He didn't just say one. And so now we see, now we're in the New Testament. And God has been bringing us all from different cultures, from different backgrounds, different countries, different languages, and everything to produce a new family. The family that he has always designed. Okay? That's what makes us peculiar. Amen. So I'm just going to recap everything, and we'll go ahead and end in prayer. What I want you guys to take away from tonight is that what makes us peculiar, meaning distinct, okay? It does, it's, what makes us distinct is not our hair texture, not our skin tone, is not our accent, is not our ethnicity, is not who I who we identify with, you know, for me, um, it's, it's kind of easy for me to understand because I'm so mixed ethnically. You know, my mom's Indian and Native American and Portuguese and who knows what else. And then my dad's, you know, Mexican and, you know, he got the African ancestry and then you have all these di different things, you know. And so for me, you know, it's always been hard to identify with a certain group of people. If I try to I identify with the Indians, like, oh man, you're too black, you know, <laughs> I'm like, Okay, you know, I, I try to identify, you know, with the Hispanics, you know, like, oh, man, you're too black. And, okay, all right. I try to identify with the blacks, you're like, you're too whitewashed. And I was like, okay, well, um, who do I identify with? 
And then I looked at scripture and it says your, identif- your identity is found in Christ. We have a new family. And so <laughs> me having grown up like this, you know, it's kind of easy for me to grasp this and everything, but I know some people may not be. And that's okay. But I'm here to tell you, we have to let go of the old identity. It's okay that you know you identify with certain things, and it's okay. You know, it's, it's culture, it's part of being human. That's okay. Jesus, when he came down as a human, he was Jewish. And he partake of he partook of Jewish things and everything. But at the same time, he didn't let that prevent him when it came time to speak to Samaritan woman. Okay? We have a new identity, a new culture. We operate differently. We don't just identify with people that look like us. We identify with people who actually look like us in the spirit. That's my brother. That's my brother. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's my sister. And so on and so forth. Amen? So as we all stand. Remember, what makes us a peculiar people is our identity. And your identity is found in Christ. Our speech. We have to watch the way we talk. And if, if we're still struggling with how we speak and everything, whether it be bad language, whether it be, you know, innuendos or whatever, that's okay. You have the Holy Ghost to help you through that. And to help you be holy. You're already holy. You're already sanctified. Okay? You don't do this stuff to be holy. You don't do this stuff to be set apart. You're already set apart. And so I do these things because I am set apart. If you don't do it, God doesn't look at you and say, well, you're not my son. You're not my daughter anymore. No, you still are. But he just wants you to act like it. The same way like I was talking about the computer, it's not going to change what it is. It just can't do certain things that other appliances are able to do. It can't go in the water. Why? It messes up the function. And so as people of God, we can't go to certain places. We can't watch certain things, okay? We, we, we can't partake of certain practices and everything, okay? We have to love our wives, okay? We have to respect them as well. Wives have to respect their husbands and love the husbands as well. We have to love our children, and the children have to love the parents and respect, okay? We talk differently, and we conduct ourselves differently. Amen. God, we come before you right now, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord God, that we don't have to do anything to be holy. We don't have to do anything to earn your grace. But it's already been given to us. But God, help us to receive it, and not just receive it, but to apply it, Jesus. Lord God, I pray that when we go back to work, when we go back to to home, that you will begin to work on us, Lord God, and how we identify, Lord God. That we're identifying with you. That we're identifying with what Paul said, with your sufferings. Not just with the good stuff, but also, Lord God, with the things that we may not think are as pleasant or as good. God, help us to change our language, Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to change the way we conduct ourselves. Why? Because we want to bring people to you, Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to be such an example in such a light that when we go back to work, people are wanting to change and become like us, oh God. That we're not trying to change to adapt to their culture. They're trying to adapt to our culture, which is of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And God, I pray over your people right now that you'll begin to break and shatter every yoke that is over our families, that you will shatter the yokes, oh God, that are over our minds. In the name of Jesus, oh God, your word says that the anointing breaks the yoke. And so we speak that anointing right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that we will begin to assimilate into the culture that you have established, that we will not try to dictate how your kingdom is supposed to operate, but that we will submit ourselves to you, resist the devil, that he may flee our households, Lord God. That when we walk into our homes, Lord God, there is peace, there is love, there is joy, there is long-suffering, there is patience, there is meekness, that there is self-control. In the name of Jesus, I pray over your people, I pray over every husband, that he will treat his wife with love, Lord God, even when she seems to be disrespectful. I pray that every husband in here would treat their wife with love, that the the same way in your word says that they are heirs with us in the kingdom of God, that they are equal with us. 
God, I pray that you will have your hand upon them in the name of Jesus. I pray for the wives, oh God, to even though that they may feel like they're feeling unloved, that they will respect their husbands, Lord. And for those of us, oh God, who have spouses that are unsaved, that we will treat them with love and respect, that they will look at us even when they're treating us wrong and wonder how is this possible that they may glorify you and that they may see you that you may be manifested in us and through us and God I pray that you would touch the children Lord God your word says that that there will be many kids that are disobedient to parents but God I pray that that would not be said of the children of Lighthouse of the Valley I pray that you will teach us obedience Lord God help us to be submitted to your word first Lord God and to our parents and to our teachers even if we are done wrong that we may allow you to claim vengeance and that it would not be us, Lord God. That your glory may fill all of Stockton and may fill all of San Joaquin County and may fill all of the state of California and America and the whole world in the name of Jesus. That from now on when people see us at work, when they see us at school, they see you and they glorify you because of us in the name of Jesus. Somebody give God the glory and give God the praise. We give you all the glory and praise, Jesus. Amen. You are now dismissed and have a good night. In Jesus' name, drive safely. Love you all.